Good Friday to all of you, and welcome to the Oakland County Megacast on our family of TV and radio stations on Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM, a service of the Greater West Bloomfield Cable Communications Commission with operations out of Green Media Center, where Ronnie and I are at today, on Walnut Lake Road in West Bloomfield Township. That on Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99, along with Birmingham Area Municipal Access on Comcast 15 and AT&T 99 in Birmingham, in Bingham Farms, Beverly Hills, and Franklin. On the radio, also on 88.1 WBFH, The Biff, a service of the Bloomfield Hills School District, with leadership from station manager Ron Whittables. And WAHS 89.5, Avondale Community Radio, that a service of Avondale Schools with operations out of Avondale High School. Keeping us on the air each and every day over there is station manager Marty Schaefer and technical director and engineer Keith Fraley. We thank them very much for being with us each and every day as we bring you local news and information from the source all around Oakland County and the state of Michigan as we have a lot of important stories to get to. We're also broadcasting today. We're very thankful to be with the 30,000 plus likes and, subs and followers of the Oakland County Animal Shelter and Pet Adoption Center. We'll be speaking with their chief, Joni Toole, at around 10.25 this morning. She'll call in and we'll talk to her about everything going on over at the Oakland County Animal Shelter, inc including some very convenient services for you pet owners in the local area. Also joining us on the show today will be Michigan State Senator from the 8th District around Lansing, Peter Lacido. He will join us today on the, on the program. He's recently sponsored Senate Bill 956 in 2020 that uh, will, that is a uh, Changing regulations is going to be aimed at changing regulations of which COVID-19 patients are allowed to be put into nursing homes in isolation and which should not be put in, in nursing homes in isolation and instead in other facilities. We'll talk to him about that as well as the ongoing unemployment issue. We'll also talk about the same sort of topics with Ryan Berman, state representative from Michigan's 39th district as well, and Shannon Oberski, the director of external relations for Meadowbrook Hall, for Oakland University. She'll tell us about the history of that local facility as well as what they're doing now as things begin to reopen. Are they going to have tours again at Meadowbrook Hall? You'll find out in the second hour of the show. In a few minutes, we'll be joined by the new chief of police in the city of Sylvan Lake. That is Brian Bassett. He is standing by and we'll be with him in just a few minutes. But before we get to that, we got to go to our top stories of the day. And that, as always, on Civic Center TV. Com. You go click on the coronavirus link or go to civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus and you will see all of our top stories for the day right there, including now the case number at, at the case, the COVID-19 case number related to the recent outbreak at Harper's Bar in East Lansing is now at 51. Coronavirus cases in Michigan have been increasing in clusters. Uh, and on Tuesday, a notice went out that 14 people who had gone to Harper's Restaurant and Brew Pub in East Lansing had tested positive for COVID-19. Uh, uh, yesterday evening, that number had risen to 51 cases, including 49 individuals who were actually at the bar. Others were secondary cases. The ages ranged from 16 years old to 28 years old. More on that article online at civiccentertv.com. And uh, Ronnie, not a good look for my fellow Spartans up in, in East Lansing, going right back to Harper's immediately as it reopens, not social distancing, not wearing their masks, definitely spreading the disease. And then even beyond that, there are a couple cases that were secondary cases. And uh, I'm not a medical expert, but I would think that that means that you pick up the virus and then you then spread that on to someone else who was not there at the time. So right. a very dangerous situation coming out of East Lansing. You know what it is? It serves as a good reminder and a good warning to the rest of us about as the, everything is starting to reopen, not to let our guards down. And if we're going to go out to the restaurants, we all want to get out, but you still have to be sure to maintain your social distance. And to it, it, it makes me wonder too, so if you had so many people and it was packed, I would imagine that they weren't in their quarantines. 
They no. were just everyone commingling together. That's what it looked like. I saw some pictures from these articles that were posted online in different publications and in our local area and also in, in the Lansing area, uh, also on social media. And I even heard some stories. Uh, a couple of my cousins live in the Lansing area, mm -hmm. and they were up in the general area in Lansing just walking through on that day and saw from down on, from down on Mac Avenue, looked down by, uh, by Harper's and saw the line and saw people not in – not wearing clearly not wearing masks even from a distance uh, definitely not maintaining their social distance and even said on our family zoom call last weekend they looked at that and the first thing they thought was that's going to be a problem that makes you wonder too what's going to happen today with Javi Nooner this is a huge huge event in our area every year this time of year over about a hundred thousand people typically attend Javi Nooner do you think they're going to be socially distancing there today? I would almost say they're not going to be wearing their mask. Yeah, I, w I would think that too. I think that social distancing is going to be, and mask wearing, it's going to be the least of their concerns. They're not there to do that. They're there to party, and that's what they're going to do. And, and Ronnie is right. The annual Jobby Nooner Boat Party is happening today despite the pandemic. The Jobby Nooner Boat Party is still happening Uh the festival, as it's called, is not endorsed or formally organized. St. Clair County Sheriff Deputy Steve Campow said, quote, our goal, as it has been for years, is to keep people alive. Officials are calling for social distancing at the event, but they don't intend to enforce it. It is a, is a purely unsanctioned event, and officials hope people will act responsibly. Uh, kind of alarming that they're saying they are calling for social distancing but aren't going to enforce it, despite that being an unsanctioned event. That, that seems to make the situation even more dangerous than it already is, just visually, on the surface. We're already starting to see a spike in the COVID cases. As more and more testing is happening, things are starting to reopen, and then we've had a lot of protests where people were also not socially distancing, although most of the protesters were wearing masks. But we're seeing a spike so after some of these big events, are we going to continue to see a spike, especially with Javi Nooner? You have people who come from all over, even Canada, to uh, attend that boat festival. Yeah, it's a, it's a big event every single year at the at the end of the month of June, and uh, I don't know. It seems like it seems like this is the the year to kind kind of back off a little bit, hit the brakes, and not go as hard. Or if you do, if you are going to go there and you are going to do similar things, to take those extra precautions. You know, stick with people that you're around commonly and that you are ideally cohabitating with but at the very least you know are going to are going to stay safe wear your masks when you're not consuming uh ideally food but gen but realistically alcohol in this case for those for those over 21 years old please and uh <laughs> And maintain social distance. You don't know where all of these other people have been. A lot of these people, I would assume, you have never met before until you're at this event. So hopefully they'll, they'll maintain some semblance of safety, but I think that's going to be the least of their concerns, and I wouldn't expect that to be what we see happen. Also making news, according to the AARP, to guard Michigan seniors from the coronavirus, you need to avoid nursing homes. A 23-page report written by AARP Michigan and public sector con consultants Disrupt Disparities 2.0 looks at ways to prevent, to protect seniors from COVID-19. One of these, one of those is shifting public funds from nursing homes to home and community-based care services that would offer Michigan seniors more independence and protect them from the, the coronavirus. As of Thursday, Michigan listed about one in three of the state's deaths to be residents in nursing homes. The, reported, the report listed several ways for Michigan seniors to, quote, age in place, quote, unquote, age in place, say, save on medical costs and draw $335 million in untapped federal funds. Uh, new data suggests that pregnant women are more vulnerable to COVID-19. A new CDC study suggests that pregnant women may be at an increased risk for severe illness from the virus. This study shows that pregnant women were more than five times more likely to be hospitalized than non-pregnant women, uh, making them also more likely to be admitted to the ICU, intensive care unit, and placed on a ventilator. The CDC urges people to continue practicing social distancing and, of course, wearing PPE like your masks when you're not, of course, eating or in a situation like we're in where we're broadcasters, we're on the air, but the second we get off, 
Yeah, we both we both have our masks. Ronnie's is on her neck. Mine's on this little desk right next to me. And we put them right back on before we head back out. We urge that of you too. And uh, it, it's a really sad story to see that pregnant women are being more vulnerable now to this too, because that of course puts the the baby at at risk as well. Added stress on top of that. A lot of women, when you're pregnant, you're already going through changes in your body. A lot of people are sick the first trimester, so you're adding this concern of COVID-19 on top of that. It has to be a hard time for women going through pregnancy. It de definitely has to be, and uh, we're, our thoughts are definitely with anybody that is uh, dealing with COVID-19 during their pregnancy or has had to deal with that during their pregnancy. Um, more stories like that and more at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. Also, for those watching on TV, links to reputable resources throughout the local area, national, state, and county, as well as municipalities. Click on the CDC, the state of Michigan, and Oakland County will take you straight to COVID-19 related pages so you can find more information. And then you have access also from a direct link to many municipalities all throughout our coverage area so you can get more information that you need to know right here on civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. Also, you can watch all of our full interviews as well as clips and full episodes at civiccentertv.com slash megacast and learn more about our partnering stations who are with us each and every day on the program as we talk to people all throughout the community about important topics, news, and information that we all need to be not, we all need to be a little more cognizant of in the community talking with experts like our first guest today Brian Bassett the new police chief in the city of Sylvan Lake joining us now in the Oakland County Megacast Chief Bassett welcome to the program Thanks for having me Good to have you with us how are you how have, how have you been over the course of the pandemic uh, good. I think like everybody, uh, we've been trying to get through it, trying to uh, make sure that you know everybody's family's healthy, safe. But uh, so far, so good. So you were just recently named the chief of police in Sylvan Lake. I was going to ask if you've started already, but I see your uniform clearly has the Sylvan Lake <laughs> insignia on it. So I'm assuming that's a yes. Uh, how's it been so far in this case? Now that we know we have, of course, started. Well, I, I'm in I'm in my second week, so uh, thing, things have been great so far. I, I, I think uh, I think so far on day uh, what are we at now? Day day eight, day nine, we're, we're we're doing pretty good. So your thoughts on the new city and department so far? How do you like it? How have you been adjusting? Um, anything that you are in in the process of changing so far or readjusting? So you know, obviously being brand new to the department, I wanted to come in and just take a look at what's going on. And, and up to this point, I'm, I'm very impressed. Um, it, it's a very professional group of officers. Um, and then also getting a chance to spend more time in the community, uh, get to know the community. This is Sylvan Lake is just a, a great community and I'm really excited to be a part of it. For those unfamiliar, what's your previous experience before coming in and taking over the department here in Sylvan Lake? So I spent 22 years in Southfield. I, I just recently retired from uh, Southfield Police Department as the uh, deputy chief of police. Um, I was lucky enough to get to do, you know, a, a thousand different things at the department, every, you know, every, every area of the department. And uh, that experience, I hope, will serve me well in my new position. So Ronnie over here, my... Uh, who hosts the show with me, Ronnie Dahl, in the, in the studio with us at Lakes FM. She's in Kegel Harbor. Um, we work a lot with the Kegel Harbor Police Department. And, of course, their police chief, who's been there for, uh, I believe, two years now, or just about two years, John Fitzgerald, yeah. also came from the Southfield Police Department. Is there something about the Southfield Police Department that just really fits, makes it an easy fit coming into Greater West Bloomfield as a new police chief? Well, I I'll, uh, I'll even go one further. Um, uh, Chief uh, Joe George from Orchard Lake was also originally from uh, Southfield. So all, all, all of all, all three of the chiefs are retired from Southfield. Um, I, I think, you know, to your point, what Southfield brings um, is, you know, it's it's a, a larger city. You get a chance to really do a lot of different things. And I hope for myself, Chief Fitzgerald. Um, you know, Chief Joe George, that we all are able to bring that experience uh, to our new communities. And Chief, one of the things sometimes in the past, let's just say maybe a few other chiefs didn't get along so well. So now that you all have a similar background, you all come from the same department, do you think we're going to see a lot more 
working together between the three communities because we are so close together. Yeah, to your point, I mean, uh, they've been, uh, both chiefs have been extremely gracious, uh, you know, as well as West Bloomfield, their chief, their deputy chief have already reached out to me. Um, the only thing that I'm struggling with is both the Kegel Harbor Police Department and Orchard Lake Police Department have instructed me that I have to buy lunch. So I'm still I'm still trying to work through that. Um, I'm not sure if that's an indefinite order or if it's just a couple lunches. So I'll, I'll let you know how that goes. Well, uh I think they should have to return the favor as well as a welcoming you to the community. No, they, in all seriousness, they've been great. Um, they've been very gracious. Any, you know, they, they've, they've uh, said, any, you know, any, any questions, any challenges, any, any things that we need. And also just looking at uh, making sure that we're capitalizing on the resources we have and, and uh, making sure to help each other. So they've been, they've been great. Um, and I look forward to, uh, you know, strengthening those partnerships. How many people on your force currently, full-time, part-time? So we have uh, five full-time officers, two part-time officers, and four reserve officers. Having to patrol during the pandemic, what's the biggest challenge? Are you able to still get PPE? I know in the beginning it was hard. S the supply chain seems to be opening up, but do you anticipate the longer this goes on that that could become an issue? So, you know, to your point at the beginning, it was very difficult. Uh, it was challenging because, of course, everybody, um, the, the private sector, government, everybody was trying to get a hold of that PPE. Um, we've been lucky that we have our partners at Oakland County and working with them in Homeland Security through Oakland County. Um, we've been able to get the necessary PPE that, that is, you know, to make sure that we're able to operate. Obviously, I don't know what that's going to look like in six months, but at this point, uh, we have been able to get all of the PPE that we need so that our officers are safe. Brian Bassett, the Sylvan Lake Police Chief, joining us on the Oakland County Megacast today on our family of TV and radio stations all throughout the local area. Chief, you're coming in at a, to this new position at a really interesting time in, in, our, in our country as uh, the public is fighting for, is battling for police reforms and urging police reforms, better training, better, op better operations day-to-day, -day, community relations, and so on. Uh, your thoughts on the situation and, and what kind of training are you going to be, are you requiring in Sylvan Lake? Have you been accustomed to from your experience in Southfield? And what is needed going forward to make those necessary changes that we've been talking about for, for the course of this entire month? So as I mentioned before, the, the group of officers that we have here in Sylvan Lake, uh, you know, are, are very professional. I'm excited to work with them. And I think that, you know, my experience is we focused on use of force. We focused on de-escalation. Uh, we focused on implicit bias. And I will continue to emphasize uh, training and making sure that the officers have the training that they need. But, but to your original point of uh, this being, I guess, an interesting time, a challenging time, you know, I look at it in law enforcement as an opportunity. Um, I, I fully support uh, individuals coming out and, you know, expressing their First Amendment rights. Um, and what I think it does, sometimes they're uncomfortable, but I really think it creates an opportunity for conversation, not just conversation with law enforcement, but conversation with uh, society as a whole. Um, conversation with how is society going to interact with those with mental illness and how are we going to deal with that? Uh, conversations about how are we going to deal with those with drug addiction? And uh, again, how are, as a society, are we going to treat that? How are we going to interact with that um, as law enforcement? So they're challenging questions. They're, you know, at times uncomfortable to work through, but I think that it's good to have those discussions and and again, I see it as a, a positive for law enforcement. I see it as a positive for society as a whole to get that chance to really talk about that and for everybody to be engaged in the process. Brian Bassett is with us, the new Sylvan Lake Police Chief on the Oakland County Megacast on Civic Center TV, Lakes FM, Birmingham Area Municipal Access Television, as well as 88.1, The Biff, WAHS, 89.5, Avondale Community Radio, and the Facebook page of the Oakland County Animal Shelter and Pet Adoption Center Chief. The 4th of July holiday is coming up. Uh, a lot of waterfront in Sylvan Lake, a lot of beachfront in Sylvan Lake. And uh, fireworks shows all throughout the local area are also being canceled. So people are consuming, are using more consumer fireworks 
as well. Let's go through it one by one in terms of beachfront and watercraft safety. What are you encouraging for residents of the city of Sullivan Lake and those who may be coming in to Sullivan Lake to engage in those activities to keep the community safe during these times? Yeah, so obviously anytime you have these uh, holiday uh, weekends, long you know, ho holiday periods, um, in law enforcement are always concerned about the, the, the mix of uh, you know, water sports, uh, boating, alcohol, fireworks. Um, so as always, we encourage being responsible. Um, whether that's you know your use of alcohol, whether it's fireworks, um, please be safe, be responsible. Um, you know if you have any specific questions about anything, we'd be happy to answer that. But again, we, we just caution: have a great time, you know, enjoy your family, but please, you know, be cautious. Chief, if you can clarify something for me, I'm always confused when I go to Sylvan Lake. And if you're going down to the beach area and they have the barricades up, does that mean if you don't live in Sylvan Lake, you can't go to that area? Or can you go around the barricades? I've seen that a few times. What exactly is the purpose and what's the proper rules and regulations surrounding that? Because I, yeah, so I may have once or twice uh, uh -oh. broken them possibly, oh, no. <laughs> but I like to run through there and <laughs> the beach there is great. So first, you know, first and foremost, the barricades are designed to prevent um, vehicular traffic. And, and I think really it's indicative of what Sylvan Lake is in the community. It's a very family friendly environment. We want it to be walkable. Um, so when you see those barricades, it's meant for vehicular traffic to your point. Um, if, if you're running, I, I, you know, I'm also a runner, so I hope you enjoy it. We've had great weather for running the last uh, couple of weeks, so hopefully you're getting a chance to get out. Um, but if you're using our parks or the beaches, you have to have a, a park pass, um, which you can get from uh, City Hall here. So, but again, if, you know, and to your point, if you're running through, I, I hope you're running. I hope you're enjoying it. Thank you. And just to clarify, to get the park pass, you do have to be a Sylvan Lake resident then? Correct. Okay. And is there a fee with that? There is, yes. And, and right off the top of my head, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm blanking out on the amount, so I don't want to quote it. <laughs> so, but, but City Hall, make sure to get you those fees. Okay, great. Thanks. Brian Bassett with us, the Sylvan Lake Police Chief on our family of TV and radio stations that makes up the Oakland County Megacast. Chief Bassett, before we let you go, anything else you'd like to say or any other topics that we haven't touched on just yet? No, again, I'm just, you know, uh, very grateful that, you know, to be now working with Sylvan Lake and also the whole greater West Bloomfield area. It's just a wonderful community. Um, and I look to, you know, I, I'm excited to, to serve the community um, and continue to strengthen the partnership between law enforcement and the community. So I, I appreciate the opportunity today. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for being on with us. We appreciate having you on as well. Chief Brian Bassett, the new P chief of police for the city of Sylvan Lake with us on the Oakland County Megacast all across the Oakland County area on a variety of community television and radio stations. And also today on the Facebook page of the Oakland County Animal Shelter and Pet Adoption Center, who we'll be joined by next. Their, their chief, Joni Toole, will join us on the program next. You're watching and listening to the Oakland County Megacast on Civic Center TV, Birmingham Area Municipal Access, 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 The Biff, and WAHS, 89.5 Avondale Community Radio. We will return after this break. Coronavirus has put us to the test. Now it's time to put it to the test. We've greatly expanded testing in Michigan. So people who think they may have COVID-19 with symptoms like fever, cough, and shortness of breath can get tested. And those without symptoms who work in public can now get tested as they could carry the virus. Start by calling your healthcare provider or contacting a testing site near you. Learn more at michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Technology like smartphones are wonderful devices to reduce social isolation in older adults. You can call grandchildren, phone friends, participate in fitness classes, and play games. But you need to stay mindful of scams. Scams related to the COVID-19 virus are rising. These include attempts to obtain personal information from seniors, including pitching unreliable products, advice, tests, and cures. You need to stay vigilant and be cautious. If you feel that you have been taken advantage of, it's okay for you to reach out 
to somebody you know and seek out advice or even contact your medical provider. Thank you. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast on Civic Center TV and Birmingham Area Municipal Access. You can also watch us online in high definition on civiccentertv.com and on the Facebook page of the Oakland County Animal Shelter and Pet Adoption Center. You can listen to us on the radio, 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 The Biff out of the Bloomfield Hill School District and WAHS. 89.5 Avondale Community Radio. That is service of Avondale Schools out of Auburn Hills alongside Ronnie Dahl. I'm Tyler Keeft in our Lakes FM studios, our flagship radio station uh, here. And, of course, we mentioned earlier we are on the page of the Oakland, the Facebook page of the Oakland County Animal Shelter and Pet Adoption Center. And now over the telephone, we are joined by the chair of the of the Oakland County, sorry, the chief, my apologies, of the Oakland County Animal Shelter and Pet Adoption Center, Joni Toole, with us on the Oakland County Megacast. Joni, thank you for being with us today. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah, uh, it's good to have you with us. How are you? How's your team at the Animal Shelter doing? We're doing good. We're doing good. We came uh, through this uh, COVID-19 pandemic pretty good. Um, We've got a lot of dogs out in the foster, and that's all thanks to a wonderful rescue that we work with called Do Only Good. So they got a lot of dogs out of here before we had to close down to the public. That's good to hear. I, I was curious. How did the facility uh, and how did the team on site, how were they able to hold up operations as this was beginning and things were going to be shutting down because you have to keep in mind in, in, in this situation, you're not just worried about your staff that's on site and, and those that may be coming into the facility. You're also worried about these animals as well because at that time, we had no clue if COVID-19 could also be spread to our pets. Exactly. So we were doing, we were trying to keep up on that. Um, our veterinarian here, Dr. Gropson, is, is um, very good at keeping up with um, the science with all that. So we actually had rooms set up that if we had to quarantine animals because they were exposed to COVID. And now it kind of looks like maybe that's not the case. Um, we only had one or two animals that were exposed to the COVID. So, um, but we've been here the whole time. We, we never left because of, you know, the animals, they need care and they need to be fed. They need to be clean. So we've been working right through the pandemic. So it's been interesting, very interesting. Joni, this is Ronnie. So are you open for adoptions now? Yes, we are open for adoptions now. It's a little bit different because we're asking uh, the public to make an appointment so that we have individual staff to walk them through the building. And we're also screening people before they come in and asking them the questions that you normally get asked at the doctor's office. Um, but we wanted to make sure that we had a staff member that could escort everyone through the building, not like your normal everyday operations like we like it, people to just come and visit and wander around and see the animals. We kind of can't do that right now. but. We are open. We're ready for business. You just got to make an appointment. Joni Toole with us. She is the chief of the Oakland County Animal Shelter and Pet Adoption Center, who also happens to be our Facebook partner today. So we thank them for having uh, us on with them and thank their 30,000-plus uh, followers for joining us all morning long on the Oakland County Megacast. Joni, you have some other special services going on right now at the Animal Shelter to help local pet owners without them having to go into your facilities. Explain what you have going on right now. Yes. Um, even though, you know, this might be the furthest thing from people's minds, it's not further from ours because we always like to have um, our dogs licensed within Oakland County. That helps them get home. Um, you've only got a 35% return rate to owners of dogs that come into our shelter. So we're always trying to boost uh, citizens getting their dogs licensed. So because of the pandemic and us having to make appointments to see our citizens and for them to purchase their dog license, we felt as though maybe it would be better if we did this curbside. 
so every Friday, weather permitting, um, we've got a crew out in our parking lot where you can just drive up, show us your dog's rabies vaccination certificate, and then we'll sell you an Oakland County dog license. And also we've waived the delinquent fee. Dog licenses are usually um, over $30 right now because we're in the delinquent period. You should have purchased it before June 1st. We've waived that, so most licenses are $10.50. So if you're out and about, don't forget, grab your rabies vaccination. If you still need to get your dog license, you can come here to the shelter every Friday from 10 until 4, and we'll be out there in the parking lot, and you can just pull up, no need to get out of your car, and purchase your dog license there. We're also doing it at All About Animals. It's a low-cost clinic in Auburn Hills on Joslin. In fact, they're there today doing the same thing. You can go there and get your dog's license, and they're going to be there from 10 until 2. And that's going to happen. Um, it's happening today. It'll happen July 24th, July 31st, and August 7th. So if you need to get your dog's license and you just don't want to go into your treasurer's office or come into the shelter, we've set it up so that we've made it really easy. You can just pull up and get it and drive away. I think that's important to know because a lot of uh, city halls where people would normally go and get that, they are still closed to the public. So this is a good way to get it. And also a lot of vets are doing curbside service as well. Yes, they are. In fact, um, that's what All About Animals, they're open for business. you got to call and make an appointment. But if you need to get your dog in to get its rabies vaccination, you can most certainly do it there. And like I said, they're a low-cost clinic. They're a wonderful Um, clinic that helps the community with low-cost services for your pet. Let's talk a little bit about your Facebook page, because every time I go on it, my heart (laughs) breaks. I'm like, I want that dog. We have a new rescue that our hands are full with right now, but when you see these animals, it's so hard because you know rescues really are some of the best pets. Yes. They are. I've always liked the what you call the Heinz 57, you know, um, just the mutts. Um, I think they're just a durable pet, and they usually have the best personalities to me, but that's my opinion. But, yeah, we do have a lot of wonderful pets that find their way to here, and then we do need to find loving forever homes for them. Yeah, our, our producer Jeff had said yesterday after we were getting everything set up for the Facebook partnership today, he was looking at your Facebook page before he called you and before we uh, set everything up and said he was he was right at the point of, of of crying at the cuteness of all the of all the cats on the, on the page you had there. And I'm I'm a recent cat adopt adopter also. Uh, oh. I did from another shelter in December and. Uh, I remember when I was looking around, I, I looked at the Oakland County Animal Shelter as, as well, and uh, it made me. It, it got to the point where where I was seriously considering. You know what? I'll just I'll just I'll just adopt all the cats. I'm just going to adopt every cat from that from everywhere <laughs> over. I'm just gonna I'm just going to become one with the cats. And, and on that note, right now a lot of people have more time on their hands. They're at home. Uh, they've been at home throughout this process, and they've also been looking to adopt as well. Um, and they believe that this is the time. This is the perfect time for us to adopt a, a puppy and raise a puppy and, and get get that get the dog acclimated to the home and, or another animal as well. Is that a correct statement, or is that more based on person to person? Oh well, actually, I mean, we had a lot of people. We were still answering the phones while we were closed as well. And yes, people were looking for pets to adopt when when we were all locked down. Um, So we had various rescues that helped people connect with pets. No, it's a wonderful time to get your pet acclimated to your family, get it on a schedule, um, because those things are so hard to do when you're working and you don't have a lot of time and the kids got school events and this and that, and it just seems more of a, you know, a burden to you. I don't want to say that, but, you know, when you're running around and you're trying to do all this stuff, so when we're you know, shut down. Yeah, it's a wonderful time to get a pet and acclimate them to your household. Johnny Tool with us. She's the chief of the Oakland County Animal Shelter and Pet Adoption Center. So on that note, Joni, uh, many people have adopted animals before, and maybe they're adopting their their next animal after their uh, after their previous pet maybe had 
and passed away or, or so on and, and they're experienced in that regard but for those that aren't and are adopting for the first time what do people need to consider before they're adopting a pet uh, either animal to an animal or just in general well i this is a big pet peeve of mine and i know we're all visual you know we like what we like you know when we see something that we like a lot of people i'll just use it for an example like huskies they're beautiful just beautiful animals but do your research if you are a couch potato a husky is not for you you need to find a breed that's a little more laid back and doesn't need so much exercise so that's that's my biggest advice is do some breed research and see what animal would fit best into your lifestyle may not even be a dog maybe a cat works better for you because you're not home a lot and cats are really self-sufficient, but they're there when you want to snuggle and love on them. So do your research and really find one that, you know, if you're going for looks, then find one that fits into your lifestyle as well. So that's my biggest advice right there. And, and that has to be something that, that's key in all of this because you're not just bringing in a pet into your home. You're also now a part of their life for the re duration, ideally the duration of their life as well and if that fits not right it's going to be that a bad situation both for you and for that animal as well yes and we do see that every day unfortunately that's the bad part you know the people don't know what they're getting into and it's overwhelming and then they just can't do it anymore so they're bringing them in here and relinquishing them to us it's sad it's very sad it's very hard on the animal it's hard on the human um, we just, I've always been a proponent of do your research, know what it's going to take, know what it's going to cost so that you don't have to go through that heartbreak because it's really stressful and hard on the animal. What's the most unusual pet that has come through your facility? Well, we had a prairie dog once, and then we've had, we've had several different snakes, monkeys, um, we even had a cougar, which was really strange. Um, but I mean, we, those are few and far between, thank God. Um, and we aren't really equipped to handle that kind of stuff, especially like alligators. We do. We were seeing there for a while a lot of alligators, which we would ship over to the Michigan Humane Society. But um, yeah, people get into some weird things, and then I don't think they quite know what they're getting into, and then they end up here. So. <laughs> So taking it back to adoption, Joni Toole, the chief of the Oakland County Animal Shelter and Pet Adoption Center, we talk about what people need to consider before they adopt, but right after they have executed an, an adoption and they're bringing a, an animal into their home, and I know it varies from pet to pet. It's, di it's different for dogs than cats. It's different for cats than birds and, and so on and so forth. What should people be doing or considering immediately after they're bringing a, a new pet into their home? Well, I would probably bring it into a quiet environment at first. Um, I wouldn't like invite the whole neighborhood over to meet it because <laughs> that's probably going to scare it. Um, but a nice quiet environment. If you have another pet and you're getting, you're adopting a newer pet, you want to make sure that that transaction goes very slow and you supervise it very carefully. I know a lot of people just throw animals together. It's a good way to get the animals hurt and for you to get hurt. So you want to introduce them slowly. Uh, another thing is you'll want to start a schedule, um, you know, so that the dog knows when it's time to go outside and go to the bathroom. It knows when it's time to eat, that type of thing. Not so much for cats because they can kind of be <laughs> pretty self-contained. But you want to get that dog on a schedule so that they know that that's when it, and that will minimize your accidents in the house if you put them on a schedule and you stick to that schedule. I noticed on your Facebook page you were posting a lot of pictures of pets that were lost. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about the importance of not only the dog license, but microchipping as well. Oh, yes, definitely. Microchipping is awesome because it can't get lost it's with the animal and local vets can scan dogs too if you find a lost dog you can always take it to your local vet and they can scan it and get it home um, dog licenses same thing as long as they're wearing them we can get them home 
And like I said, there's only um, 35% of the dogs that we take in here get back to their owners, and even less for cats. It's more like 2% for cats. So it's so important to have ID on your pet or have them microchipped so we can get them back to you. Um, 75% of our population here are stray. So that's the majority of what we do. And we would love to see our percentage of return to owners, is what we call them, go up. Um, we just want to make sure we get the word out that if you're missing a pet, you can contact us. You can look on our website and see if we've received it. So there's all different ways that you can try and look for your lost pet. Johnny Toole with us, the chief of the Oakland County Animal Shelter and Pet Adoption Center. We're also our Facebook partner on today's edition of the Oakland County Megacast. Joni, um, adoption and, and pet licensing and so on are only some of the services that are provided by the Animal Shelter and Pet Adoption Center. Go through for us what are some of the other services that Oakland County Animal Shelter and Pet Adoption Center provides. Well, for our road unit, that means that we're out patrolling the area and picking up strays and um, bringing them back to the shelter so that we can take care of them. They're also investigating cruelties. Um, that takes up a lot of our time as well. And uh, here at the shelter, um, you know, animals get into all kinds of messes when they're out running the streets. Um, we get in a lot of injured animals and we try to help those animals. We do have a vet clinic here on site where we can take care of them and if we can't take care of them then we use local emergency vets. So um, we're trying to take care of all these animals and get them back to their owners and then if that doesn't happen then we love to have the public come in and visit and see if we can match them up with a forever pet. So that's some of the um, uh, things that we offer here at the shelter. Joni, anything else before we let you go today? No, um, I think, you know, get your dogs licensed. Uh, microchip your cats if you're going to let them outside. Um, and if you're missing your pet, please check your local shelters. Well, thank you very much for being with us. Joni Tool, the chief of the Oakland County Animal Shelter and Pet Adoption Center with us on the Oakland County Megacast. Joni, thank you for being with us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Joni Tool with us uh, from the Oakland County Animal Shelter and Pet Adoption Center. They are also our Facebook partner today on today's edition of the Oakland County Megacast. Yeah, and such an important topic for us to be talking about because there are these are issues that we have on normal on normal days and normal seasons in terms of pets that are escaping their homes and running away from their homes and are not able to be found or people that have unlicensed animals and end up getting fines or, or God forbid, having their pet being taken away from them or even the, on the issues of adoption, Ronnie, where people are not quite prepared for either the individual pet that they're bringing in or the concept of pet ownership altogether and that can cause some problems for their families as well as for their animals. Getting a new pet is really a full-time commitment. We, uh, our Cocker Spaniel died this past uh, January. We fostered another dog that is, she might be a, a mutt, <laughs> uh, but it's, she's big. She, they think she's like a lab schnauzer, mm -hmm. and we're not used to having such a big dog. So it's really been an adjustment for us to try to deal with the dog of that size. So like she said, do your homework before you bring some of these pets into your home because it's important to know what you're getting, but also not just for you, but for that pet as well. I think for Trixie, we're like her third home by the time that she came to us, third or fourth home. Yeah, it's, it's always best to know what you're getting into before you're getting into it, especially in a situation where you're bringing another life into your home and, and the, and these animals also have their own feelings, their own personalities, their own experiences, that no, their own collective experiences that influence their life. And even if it doesn't end up working out with your family and this animal, they could go to another home. And some of the instances that they that they undergo with your family, if it's not the right situation, could be traumatizing to them. So it's it's best to be respectful and be cognizant of that as best as you possibly can, and always reach out 
for advice from shelters that you adopt from and from Oakland County's animal shelter as well. And one thing to keep in mind as well is if you can't bring another pet into your home or you go onto their Facebook page and your heart melts, there are other ways to support these organizations, yes. the shelter. I'm constantly dropping off donations. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, like when the Cocker Spaniel passed away, we had a lot of different things, like the new dog didn't eat that dog's food or all the snacks or blankets. Old towels are always needed in a lot of these shelters. So there are a lot of different ways to support these organizations other than just bringing another pet into your home or volunteer. So if you can't have a pet, maybe you're in an apartment and your landlord won't let you have one, there's nothing better than volunteering. You're, it's not a commitment. You kind of get your, your doggy fix or your kitty cat fix. You know, you're, you're playing with the animals. It, it lifts your spirits. You feel better. The pet feels better. And you're helping the organization at the same time. So there's a lot of different ways to to help the pets if you can't bring one into your home. Absolutely. And we are so fortunate in our area, too, Ronnie, that we have a lot of great animal shelters and animal rescues that are all working together constantly too. It's not a competition between them. They work very well together. I, I was pointed to a couple of great shelters when I was looking for my kittens um, before adopting them that ultimately led, led me to the shelter that I adopted from in the local area. And they've been fantastic and are always advocating for their uh, neighboring shelters in the local area as well. So it's always a partnership. These people do definitely care about these animals deeply. And they're always looking for more people, as you said, to get involved and to help, and to help them out. That's awesome. It is. Ronnie Dahl, Tyler Keeft in the Lakes FM studios at Civic Center TV on Walnut Lake Road in West Bloomfield. We're going to take a quick break. We'll come back. We have Erica Jones out in the field. And then the cab off the top. And then just after the top of the hour, we will be talking with Senator Peter Lucido from Michigan's 8th District Senator who sponsored uh, Senate Bill 2020-956 regarding COVID-19 patients being put into nursing homes. You're watching and listening to the Oakland County Megacast. We'll return after this short break. Michigan, we still need to stay careful because we don't want to go backwards, back to where we started. So keep standing six feet apart, keep wearing a mask in public, and if you have symptoms, talk to a healthcare provider about getting tested. To move forward, let's all do our part. So stay careful. Michigan.gov slash coronavirus. Michigan, we're calling on you to save lives. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19, to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, answer the call. Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Coronavirus has put us to the test. Now it's time to put it to the test. We've greatly expanded testing in Michigan. So people who think they may have COVID-19 with symptoms like fever, cough, and shortness of breath can get tested. And those without symptoms who work in public can now get tested as they could carry the virus. Start by calling your healthcare provider or contacting a testing site near you. Learn more at michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast on a family of TV and radio stations on Civic Center TV and Birmingham Area Municipal Access on Comcast Channel 15, AT&T Channel 99, online in high definition on CivicCenterTV.com and on the Facebook page of the Oakland County Animal Shelter and Pet Adoption Center. 
We're also on the radio on local radio stations on 89.3 Lakes FM, on 88.1 WBFH, The Biff, and on WAHS 89.5. Avondale Community Radio all throughout the local area. Now, throughout this entire pandemic, Ronnie and those of you listening, of course, we know we've had some uh, shortages of certain key items. Definitely early on, it was it was a toilet paper, and it then it transitioned from a toilet paper to being any household cleaner, to being sprays, to being PPE, and so on and so forth. And that's still maybe the case t- today, Ronnie, so we'll find out about that. We have Erica Jones out in the field. She's been looking around for supplies that have been a little bit sparse throughout this, and we're, we're going to go to her and see, are those more available now? Erica, where are you at, and uh, where are you at in the community? Hi, Tyler. So I'm at Walmart on Pontiac Trail, and unfortunately, the connection in the store just wasn't going to cut it. That's so fine. I came back outside, but I did get to look around a little bit, and I can tell you that 100 days into the pandemic, just like we were reading this morning with uh, on the Detroit Free Press, there's an article there, and uh, 100 days in, the shelves are still empty for a lot of essential cleaning products. Um, they did have some toilet paper and paper towel, but very, very empty shelves in general, definitely more empty than full shelves. So there are definitely products that are hard to get, even things like bleach, you know, they just have signs everywhere that say this item is temporarily out of stock and there are people just in the aisles, you can tell, calling home to their families, probably just reporting that, hey, they don't have it, I'm coming home empty handed. So it's definitely very hard still to oh. get these items, which is crazy 100 days in and we're still facing the same struggles in some ways that we saw, you know, three, four months ago when this all started. Erica, a lot of these places too, were- early on and, de- and definitely midway through the process in particular with, uh, I know for a while there was an issue with a shortage of some meats. And mm-hmm. so they were putting limitations on how many of each item people were going to be able to, uh, to purchase it. For the, for the items that were available that you saw, were you able to, to, to see if there was any sort of limit that was still being put on those items? Or maybe that could be a reason that some of them are still flying off the shelves. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's crazy, come to think of it, there are signs everywhere that say that there's limits on the amount of items you can buy, you know, one case of water bottles, one case of paper towels. So it's crazy that even given those limits on how many items you can buy, they're still flying off the shelves because it's not like people can go in and just, you know, buy 10 cases of waters or whatever else they need. So yes, they do have signs everywhere, at least all through the, you know, cleaning aisles and stuff that say, you know, attention, please be respectful. You can only buy one item. And, you know, I've even done some online shopping, you know, at the beginning, especially when, you know, going out was completely um, out of the question. And I would go online and try and order stuff from Walmart and they limit your cart. So online, it doesn't allow you to buy more than the allotted amount. And not even just at Walmart, you know, Costco to all these big stores, they're only letting you buy very limited amounts of things because they need to make sure that everyone's able to get the essentials. Erica Jones with us out in the field in the local area, going around to our local stores to make see what the uh, collection of some necessary and essential products are at the at these stores. So, so Erica, on another topic, earlier on in this pandemic, uh, about a month ago, we sent you to another local, uh, gr- local d- grocery and department store. Uh, just initially on after they had put some new regulations in place to check in on those. And one of those regulations that's been a staple all over the place has been wearing your mask and keeping your social distance. Are you noticing people today in, in the store that you're at keeping up with their social distancing and, and wearing their masks properly or just at all? Social distancing, no. To be completely honest, I don't think people are very aware of keeping that six feet. And I just... Quite frankly, I don't think it's something they pay attention to or even think about. As far as masks goes, I would say I'm pleasantly surprised with the amount of people wearing masks. There is, uh, well, the lady walking in right now does have one on her neck, so hopefully she'll put it in as she walks in. But other than that, I saw one person walking out a minute ago not wearing a mask, which we hate to see. But I would say overall, oh, two guys walking out right now without them, but overall, most people definitely are wearing them and adhering to that uh, guideline because there are signs when you walk in that say please have a facial covering so i think it's hard because i think it's more of a uh, 
recommendation than uh, something they're strictly enforcing. So they're not necessarily turning people away at the door without masks. Yeah, it's, which, it's tough to enforce that, that too, right. when you are a when you are just working in the store and you're not involved with law enforcement. There are some avenues to take on on that. Uh, definitely talk to the manager or, or talk to an employee there and say, hey, I, I'm seeing this. It, it's probably not for the best practices. And at least put it to their attention. That's what's been suggested by Definitely. some of our local police departments and, and even by County Executive Dave Coulter a couple of weeks ago. So Erica out in the field with us right now uh, in the local area. Erica, anything else that you're seeing out in the field today uh, when you were at one of our local stores? Yeah, well, just to comment on what you just said, I actually, I haven't, but I know a couple of people personally that have been in stores and been alarmed by the lack of people wearing masks who have gone up to management and just, you know, addressed the concern and, it has not been a very uh, productive encounter that they've had. We hear a lot of them saying, you know, corporate's not allowing us to enforce it or answers like that. It doesn't really seem like any of them have said, thank you for bringing this to my attention. We'll fix that immediately. So I think it's very hard because I don't think that a lot of these places, whether it be, you know, the individual stores or corporate wide policies are enforcing it very strictly. Well, Erica, thank you for that report. Thank you for being with us. Uh, We'll, we'll go back to you uh, very soon with more reports in, in the field. And, and Ronnie, on that topic, it, it is kind of a tough situation. We even talked with Joe Bauman from the Birmingham Bloomfield Chamber of Commerce earlier on in the week about this issue because you want to enforce that. You want to encourage that. You want to make sure that you're following those requirements in your business. But a lot of these businesses also are now coming back out of operation after several weeks or several months out of commission, and they have to balance maintaining those social distancing and those PPE wearing guidelines with also maintaining momentum for their business so they can recover as best as possible. We had the situation in Flint where the security guard was killed Yes. after requesting that someone put a mask on. So there is a safety concern for the employees. Definitely. I think one of the best things you could do is have masks there to provide to people because Sometimes you do go out and you're just forgetting to have a mask. I've had to turn around, go back home. I try to keep extras in my car. So maybe if you have additional ones there that you could hand out to people and just say, hey, could you please put this mask on? That might help ease some of those tense uh, situations. But I always find humor is the best way to yeah. diffuse those awkward moments. So in Everyone has a different personality, but you also have to remember there are some people that have medical reasons as to why they can't wear masks. So that's always the situation as well. I wonder if they should come up with like a bracelet or something, some way to ID people who do have medical reasons for not being able to wear masks. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I think that would be a good idea because, as you said, some people cannot wear them. It's obstructing their ability to breathe or they have other conditions that prevent them from wearing a mask. And they're, and they're taking their precautions in other ways. And maybe there is some sort of identifier that says, okay, this is not someone we need to be complaining about. They're doing their, their part in their own way. And, and that's okay. And that's something that we need to be encouraging. It's an interesting thing to think about. And maybe we'll see that in the, in the coming weeks and, and months as this continues on because it's going to continue on for a while. I will say, I think uh, I'm happy to see, I think the women can agree with me on this one here. I'm happy to see the, uh, there was a shortage of like hair dye for a while because like, our roots were getting bad before yeah. the beauty salons reopened. So you were seeing a shortage of the root cover up. I've noticed going back into the stores now, you're starting to see more of that as stocking the shelves. I haven't had an issue with trying to find toilet paper at all. No. And, and you know, and there for a while, every time you saw a toilet paper, you're like, oh, I gotta buy it, I gotta buy it. So now we have an abundance of toilet paper. The big thing, really, it's the wipes and the spray. Abs yeah, that that's definitely, throughout this been the consistent item or items that have not been there or if they are there they're they're, they're not there for very long has been the, those disinfectants those sprays uh wipes definitely and then ppe for a while as well it's a little bit it's a little bit better now on that front definitely but the sprays disinfectants are still items that are are still flying off the shelves as soon as they get there the toilet papers definitely calm down i think that was more along the lines of panic buying than necessity where these are M more arguably necessities in this case. One thing I keep forgetting to do is to remove my extra hand sanitizer from my car because 
there is a fire danger there. Yes. But I always have extra hand sanitizer. Once again, it, so you go in, you take your mask off. The first thing I do is I, I use it on my hands. So I have extra bottles sitting in my car, and I keep trying to remind myself I should probably put a post-it on my windshield that says remove hand sanitizer because the last thing I want to see happen is my car catch fire because I left it in there. Yeah, and, and you want to have those those extra items on you and and you want to be prepared as prepared as you possibly can be in all these situations so you're keeping yourself sanitized because you, know, you can go in and you can wear gloves and in a store but that creates a whole nother problem we've talked to m several medical officials yeah. throughout the run of this show that wearing gloves unless you really are keeping cognizant of i'm only touching certain things and once something uh, once i'm touching something it's coming with me um, you're going to be cross-contaminating a lot of items and potentially putting other people at risk. And, and other people may be putting you at risk by wearing them. So having hand sanitizer so that you can go about what you need to do in these stores and then make keep yourself clean and, and encourages everyone else to do that as well. I think that's the best practice. Yeah, yeah. What's the one thing that you were surprised there was a shortage of? <sighs> For me... I would I would say like just basic hand soaps for a, for a little while there I was saying it was it was tougher to get um, to get hand soaps because people were, were buying that too they couldn't get the disinfectant sprays and all of that and so what they were doing is they were using soap or they were using something like like vinegar or just basic other sp other cleaning sprays that maybe aren't disinfectants and that was really flying off the shelf so there's secondary uh, there's secondary items that were also be being uh, experiencing shortages yeah. as well. Hydrogen peroxide right now, mm -hmm. that's almost impossible to find. I've noticed some stores have started posting, like, it, it, you know, in the entranceway to the stores with signs saying, we are out of all of these different items. So knowing that if you were going in to look for those, they weren't there, so you didn't even have to waste your time, which is good. Yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll see um, stock of these items that were, com were commonly just there and we're, we're good to go continue to slowly but surely come back like we've seen with toilet paper and we've seen with water and we've seen with other items and those limitations may have to stay in place to make that happen but by and large i think we're definitely seeing an improvement ronnie exactly i think i saw a report clorox was expecting uh mid-july we should start being able to start seeing more of clorox wipes and things of that nature hitting the supply shelves again Absolutely, and we'll, we'll keep on that. We'll keep reporting on that. A good report by Erica out in the field today, keeping us updated. We'll be back in just a couple of, of minutes here. We're going to take a short break. When we return, we'll, sp we'll be speaking with Senator Peter Lucido from Michigan's 8th District on the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe alongside Ronnie Dahl in our Lakes FM studios. The Megacast returns after this short break. Hi, I'm Dr. Jonay Caldoun. I'm the Chief Medical Executive for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. The people who are at highest risk of getting severely ill from COVID-19 are the elderly and those with chronic medical conditions. That includes people with heart disease, diabetes, COPD, or those who have compromised immune systems. People who are in those categories should right now be staying at home as much as possible and not going out if it is not essential. If you fit into one of those categories, those are the things you should do. And if you have a family member who fits into one of those categories, you should be checking in on them and making sure they are following those guidelines. There's something everyone can do to protect the community from COVID-19. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson, and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Parks COVID-19 Help Hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet, wear facial coverings when you leave your home, and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast on Civic Center TV and Birmingham Area Municipal Access on Comcast channels 15 and channel 15 and AT&T channel 99. 
online in high definition on civiccentertv.com and on the Facebook page via Facebook Live of the Oakland County Animal Shelter and Pet Adoption Center. We thank them for joining us today on the program. Joni Tool with us earlier on in the show today. I'm Tyler Keeft in the Lakes FM studios alongside Ronnie Dahl with you on this Friday morning in the Oakland County area. Thank you for joining us today. And you can also tune in for replays later on in the afternoon, beginning at 1 o'clock on, most, uh, on uh, WBTV at about, four, about 5 o'clock on Civic Center TV today, as well as 8 o'clock on both channels. And over the weekend, you can also tune in on these stations and watch us on demand on civiccentertv.com. A uh, big issue of late ha- uh, on the state level has been the issue of keeping COVID-19 patients in nursing homes. And joining us now is a senator from Michigan's 8th District who recently sponsored a bill that would hopefully lead to some changes in that regard. Joining us on the megacast now is Senator P- Peter Lacido from Michigan's 8th District. Senator Lacido, thank you for being with us today. Yeah, good afternoon. And Tyler, Ronnie, uh, thank you for having me on the program today. Well, thank you for being with us. Just full disclosure for our audience listening. My my father, Tim Keeft, and Peter Lacido were fraternity brothers at Oakland University, so there is some history there, but, yeah. but make, make no buts about it. We're not, we're not going to let that at all impact our conversation today. We're going to have a nice conversation about COVID-19. So, Senator Lacido, how are you? How's your team been doing? Everybody's doing great. You know, it's uh, challenging times at the Capitol. We have to wear masks uh, when we're in the Senate. And when we're doing Senate business, uh, we have to wear masks in our office, anything inside. Uh, it's great to get outside when the weather's nice because you take the mask off and breathe a lot differently. But everybody's wearing masks, social distancing, doing everything they can, washing their hands uh, countlessly is the word. And at the end of the day, we still have to do the work of the people. Absolutely. And it's good to hear that, that that's going on in your office. And we've heard that similar from other from other senatorial and rep- and representative offices as well that and everyone's doing their part and I think that's what we're seeing now is that Michigan is taking this seriously whether you agree with the decisions that have been made or not we understand that this is something we have to work together on and we can argue about down the road after we're, we're through this but for now we have to focus on keeping each other safe and it's good to be seeing that there's some cooperation even at least on the base level between people on all walk, of all walks of life in Michigan and on all sides of the aisle. Yep. So, so yep. Peter, you recently sponsored a bill that, w- that passed in the Senate 24 to 13 with some Democratic support even as well that would change the dynamic in terms of COVID-19 patients being placed in nursing homes. Hindsight, hindsight's 2020. We clearly know that, that that's been a problem. What will this bill, should it pass the House and be signed into law later on, fix in regards to that problem? Tyler, let's look at history first. We learned about COVID when Dr. Caldoun and our governor came out and said, we have a virus that's hit Michigan. This was back in February, and we have to know how to deal with it. It was late February, and then March 13th, HCAM, which is the Healthcare Association of Michigan, HCAM, that's the, that's the acronym, came out and said it actually affects elderly patients and people more that are susceptible to all of the things that Dr. Caldoun said, high blood pressure, hypertension, diabetes, um, elderly who have what's called compromised immune syndrome, their systems themselves are shutting down as you get older. Your parts don't work the way they used to when you were younger and your immune system doesn't fight off diseases quick enough. So what Dr. Caldoun said is we wanna be especially attentive to those individuals. We have about 430 nursing care facilities throughout the state. LARA, Licensing Bureau, goes ahead and takes care of the licensing for nursing homes. And the DHHS, which is the Department of Health and Human Services, takes care of the protocol and policy of how we are going to stay healthy Michigan, which means how those seniors are going to be cared for, the policy involved with what structurally needs to be done. And they have the largest budget of the state. They have about $28.5 billion with a B dollars. That's a lot of money. Mm-hmm. As a result, there was a recommendation on March 13th in a memo to the governor, which Lara and DHHS were both copied on that said, we would like to set up 
facilities that are one either not licensed yet or two that are thinly being occupied and get those individuals that are coming out of hospitals that have COVID into those facilities, keeping and protecting our most beloved population, our seniors, free from people with COVID. The reason why, Governor, is one, we don't have the PPE. We're fighting with the hospitals for this, meaning they're giving it to the hospitals first. Two, we don't have the proper medical care and assistance. We have what's called personal care workers that come and do things for the nursing care facilities that are changing their diapers, washing them, clothing them, wheeling them down to the cafeteria to eat and wheeling them back to their room. If we go ahead and have COVID patients inside of our facility, we don't have the ability to separate them perfectly as the rules require because we have the same HVAC system with a cold air return, which is gonna push a virus that's airborne all around the facility. And lastly, Governor, we really just don't have this thing set up properly for having this done. In February, we learned about it. In March, the HCAM Society that looks over this medically, legally, everything said we can't do this. But yet the governor in April, April 15th was her first order that said, if your facilities are 80% or less occupied, then you must take COVID patients. Because there's a non-discriminatory practice in the law that says if you're catching Medicaid dollars and, and Medicare dollars, you can't discriminate. Well, I want everybody to realize that there was only four other states that were doing this, okay? And that's it. And those states have since changed their policy, but we'll get into that in a minute. As a result, we noticed the death count going up extremely high in nursing facilities. In fact, the ones that are around me, and I don't want to name them because of business purposes, who was actually following the letter of the order of the governor, stated unequivocally, we've got 27 deaths over here and we don't know what's going on. It was simple. The care workers were not trained and skilled to take care of the COVID. In addition, the care workers didn't have the proper PPE from the beginning because what they did was they had to use the same PPE for the entire day or day in and day out. Therefore, they were moving from one part of the facility to another part of the facility, taking care of COVID and non-COVID because there was no other help and they weren't following the guidelines. The last thing is this. We learned that the second order that the governor had indicated never was changed. We were still doing the same thing over and over, even though the death rates were going up in nursing facilities. And at the end of the day, I said, this is out of control. Why? Loved ones were calling me saying, my mom's in jeopardy. I can't get in there because the order said nobody in except the workers. Nobody out. Can't bring mom out for the weekend. And you can't even talk to them through an open window, even right now today. I mean, you can see people in jail easier than you can in a nursing facility. But that being said, let's talk about where we're at. She now is going to have testing for people coming in and out. That's great. But the people inside are the ones that get the infection. And they're going to test these elderly people sticking a Q-tip up their nose. It's about four and a half to five inches long all the way up into their, 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 their frontal cavities up here. I don't think that that's proper. I think what we needed to do in Senate Bill 956, Senate Bill 956, yeah. you can read it on the, on, on the web. You will see that the Senate Bill says no more COVID mixed with non-COVID. If they're living in the facility and that's their, their, their known address. So if I'm living already at a nursing facility, then DHHS as well as Lara, the licensing and the healthcare policy come out to the facility to see whether or not their inspectors will, because they didn't come out last time when this all started, whether or not they can be separate, that the care workers are going to be separate. They're not going to be the same working back and forth in the units, whether there's medical personnel, whether there's proper PPE, ensuring the public that the lives of those that are going to be inside are not going to be at risk. 
And anybody that's discharged from the hospital that doesn't stay in a nursing facility will not go to a nursing facility. Why? Why should we bring in more infection into a place that already has compromised immune syndrome? So therefore, it's a basic right that you have a right to live in the same place that you have. And that was some argument that one of the senators had on the other side of the aisle and said, you're taking away their right to live where they want to live. No, I'm not. If they don't have the proper PPE and everything, I'm saving their lives. I'm actually giving them a chance to live and letting the other ones live too. Because if that facility doesn't have proper care for that, that elderly, we're going to get that elderly to a proper care facility that's designated as a nursing facility for COVID only. So Senator, we're going to protect those. So wait Senator, a second. We're going okay. to protect those inside the home that don't have COVID so they don't get COVID. Go ahead. So, Senator Lucino, in that, in that case, does this bill establish a precedent for where for certain facilities where these patients would then go and for getting nursing homes in this equation they're not going going to be going there anymore under this bill where is that determined place that they go next once they're out of the hospital so that they can can continue to be put in a safe situation and keep the public safe without of course as you've mentioned putting nursing home patients at risk perfect great question and here's the answer the governor tried to establish the TCF, cost us millions and millions of dollars, cost us the National Guard to set up all this. They were staying at the greatest hotels downtown, and they deserve it because they were working around the clock to establish a thousand beds at TCF, the old Coba Hall, and have all this protocol. We never really used that. It cost us millions of dollars. The money was thrown in the toilet. In addition, Novi Expo was set up. We never used that. When I say never used it, it was a few patients in there. They knew that this wasn't going to work. So they continually and routinely and systematically discharge people from the hospital that weren't qualified for hospital care to go into a nursing facility. Now, the governor sweetened the pot by saying, I'm going to make $5,000 available to any nursing home that's 80% or occupied or less. I'm going to give you $200 extra per day when the person actually is using the, what the, that has COVID, the nursing facility, plus pay you your monthly stipend of whatever you're charging. And if it's Medicaid, Medicare, or private pay, it didn't matter. You're going to get the monthly stipend. You're going to get $200 a day for a bed. And you're going to get $5,000 to have beds available for us to do this. That's a sweetener of money. It's a motivation. I've learned recently the federal government did a complete analysis and evaluation of the nursing homes by way of five stars. There was a few five stars. The five stars were occupied 100%. Because when people know it's a good nursing home, that's where they want to put their loved one. The ones that have one and a half to two stars is where these regional hubs, they call them, were set up by the governor, where the nursing care facilities took in these patients that were COVID affected and affecting everybody in there. So they were already low on the totem pole, which meant people either didn't go to those facilities for unbeknown reasons. It could have been improper care, blah, 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 blah. They were already deficient to begin with. So in the future, HCAM, who is the health care for elderly of nursing homes, should had the, had the governor sit down with them and said, since we can't do it there to you, and they gave a recommendation. They're saying, use the homes that are not licensed. Use the ones that are going to be in the queue to get licensed. Let's set that up. Let Laura come out and let's establish facilities, eight of them regional in within the whole state of Michigan, you know, a lot down in Southeast Michigan, because we have almost half the population. Let's do it down here. We also had a hospital in Wayne, Beaumont Hospital closed and laid off 4,000 workers that were skilled that we could have used the Beaumont Hospital as a regional hub in and of itself to take care of nothing but COVID. There was proper medical people. There was proper facility. There was proper HVAC that didn't affect the virus in the air and moving from room to room. And there was proper protocol in the hospital. You can't do it any better. It would have been a perfect setting since you weren't using TCF down at Old Cobo Hall or Novi Expo. Why wasn't that a option or alternative? Now we have to subpoena from the governor and says this, my daughter worked at the CDC and I'm proud of her and her accomplishments. She went to school down in Georgia to get her master's in public health. And then she moved on and went to the World Health Organization. I asked her to look at where I can find the guidelines that talked about 
that they were follow, following from the CDC that you, has, says you can put COVID in to non-COVID facilities. I still ask Dr. Caldoun, please share with us. So, uh, you, you talk about science, you talk about data, show us the science, show us the data. Let me see, because the doctor that I had come and testify on the Senate bill 956, uh, the doctor said there is no such protocol. The doctor said her mother's in a nursing facility in Canada. And, 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 and to the point, she said, that is the worst thing you can do is put infected patients into a vulnerable, most tragic situation by allowing still these workers to cross paths and cross infect these patients. So I'd like to see the data. I'd like to see this research and CDC guidelines that they're all talking about because I'm, I'm from a place where you show me the details and the results and I'll believe you. Until I see it, I don't believe any of this. It's a topic you're very, very passionate about, obviously. So this goes to uh, the House next for a vote? Ronnie, it does. And I got to tell you, yes, I'm passionate. My dad was in a nursing facility and I learned a lot for two months to get, nurse him back to care. We, my family, because I come from a, eight children, mom and dad make 10. So we grew up in a big Italian family. We literally moved his whole living room into the nursing facility to make it feel like home for dad while he was nursing himself back. He died at 96, but for the two months that he was in the nursing facility, until we took him out and brought him home because we didn't want him there anymore. We saw the challenges that these personal care providers have. And as a result, we wanted to make sure and ensure that we were there giving my father tender loving care till the day he said goodbye because he took care of us when we were kids. My mom's 91, still alive. And she said, son, this is not right. This doesn't make sense. And I, I kind of agree with my mom. And she said, whatever you have to do, Make it right for the seniors. They're the greatest generation that ever lived. Do it. At the end of the day, I had Democrats on board on this. You should, because people are people. They're not political. This is not political. This is about conserving resources that will do the best job for the people at the time they need it most. It's also ensuring the safety and security of loved ones and their family. And yes, it's going to pass the House. And yes, it's going to get on the governor's desk. And I kind of feel that, you know what, Governor? Try something different. You know what? Try something different than just the testing. Ensure the public that you're going to be safe with their loved ones. Because what you're doing now, the tension and the frustration and the calls coming to my office, I know I'm doing the right thing when they said, keep going, Pete. Lacito, go give that bill to the governor and let her sign it. Senator Pete Lacito with us on the Oakland County Megacast. Thank you for joining us today, giving us some insight on the Senate Bill 956 that is now going to go to the House of Representatives. We appreciate you having on, and I'll, I'll say hi to my dad for you as well. Thank you for being with us. You know what? Tell him. We're, we're Theta Chi's through and through, but you know what? We're brothers, yeah. ultimately in the end. But you know what? Let's take care of the greatest generation because... God bless that generation who's taught us how to live in a better world. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Senator Pete Lacito with us on the Oakland County Megacast on our family of TV and radio stations all throughout the Oakland County area. We're going to take a short break, and when we return, we'll be joined by Shannon Oberski from the Meadowbrook Hall through Oakland University with us on the Oakland County Megacast. You are watching and listening to us on our family of TV and radio stations. We will return after this quick break. Michigan. We're calling on you to save lives. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19, to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, answer the call. Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. 
a message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Coronavirus has put us to the test. Now it's time to put it to the test. We've greatly expanded testing in Michigan. So people who think they may have COVID-19 with symptoms like fever, cough, and shortness of breath can get tested. And those without symptoms who work in public can now get tested as they could carry the virus. Start by calling your healthcare provider or contacting a testing site near you. Learn more at michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast on our family of TV and radio stations all throughout the local local area on 89.3 Lakes FM, on Civic Center TV, and on Birmingham Area Municipal Access as well. I'm Tyler Keefe alongside Ronnie Dahl in our Lakes FM studios. And Ronnie, a very passionate interview there with Senator Peter Lacido from Michigan's 8th District, who recently sponsored a bill in the state Senate regarding... Uh, putting COVID-19 patients with or without uh, nursing home patients in, in these nursing home facilities. And a lot of passion in this argument, but you saw on that bill, even when it's being passed, that uh, there were multiple Democrats that also voted in favor of the bill, and there was debate from both sides and opposition from both sides as well. So it's an issue that everyone in the state of Michigan absolutely wants to take care of. Uh, and I think in hindsight, and even to an extent the governor's office has expressed that in hindsight, it probably was not the best decision, or, de or definitely was not the best decision to put patients in facilities with other vulnerable people that could pick up the virus and be more susceptible s to severe symptoms. But that solutions have to be made now, and it's time to debate that and deliberate that in a way that's, all, that's of course, bipartisan and keeps the people the focus and, and keeps politics out of it. One thing we have to remember is this has been a learning process for everyone. This virus has touched every part of our community and everything has been a learning process because in the beginning it was maybe it's on the surfaces, maybe it's not, wear a mask, don't wear a mask. It's been changing as we've been going along and so now we have hindsight to look back on but it's about finding the solutions going forward for this point because especially if we get a second wave in the fall we need to have to we need to have some of these issues ironed out before that happens. Absolutely, and so that's going to continue to be something that's deliberated at the state level uh, in all three, in, in multiple branches of the government, in the executive branch at the governor's desk and with Dr. Caldoun, and also at, at the state legislature level in the Rep House of Representatives and in the Senate. Plenty of people we've talked to on both sides of the aisle ha have had similar reactions that this is probably not this probably was not the best decision it was what they went with at the time to make a quick decision to try to do their best to keep the general public safe and th there are some people that that did end up falling victim to those decisions and of course that's regrettable but now it's time to find solutions mm -hmm. to those issues and and we can talk about what was wrong with it after we've had solutions found and we're all out of this so moving on to so light, much lighter topics now. We have a lot of great historical, uh, historical places in our local area, including Meadowbrook Hall in our local area as well, that are still points of interest in our community, even during a pandemic. And it might be a little bit tougher to explore those points of interest, but as things start to reopen and things start to transition back to some semblance of normalcy, maybe, that will become a little bit easier. And joining us now on the program is Shannon Oberski. She is the Director of External Relations for the Meadowbrook Estate at Oakland University with us on the Oakland County Megacast. Shannon, thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. So how are you? How's your team at Meadowbrook Hall? I'm doing wonderful. Our team is doing fantastic. It, um, they got ready and opened up last Friday, so we've been very excited to welcome the community back. So how, how have things been going with, with Meadowbrook so, so far during the pandemic? Uh, I, I'm assuming now you're saying that, that staff and people are coming back, as it been, it, and I would assume it's been closed. Have there been virtual programs? Has there been anything to continue on to spread that history and the knowledge of that history throughout the pandemic? Sure. So we've done a couple of things. So as you mentioned previously, we were closed. We actually shut down on March the 17th and just reopened to the community on a limited basis starting last Friday, June 19th. 
But in the interim, we were providing some virtual experiences for our um, visitors and audience. And we partaked in a program called History at the Hall. And we did that through our social media channels where the curator would put together some videos and talk about specific histories um, and as it relate to the hall and to the community and to the Metro Detroit area. And they seem to be very popular and people seem to really engage with them. And we're gonna continue with that program even now that we're back and open again. So for those who are unfamiliar, uh, what is Meadowbrook Hall's history in the local area? Sure, sure. So Meadowbrook Hall is located on the campus of Oakland University, and it is the former residence of Matilda Dodge Wilson, as in Dodge, John Dodge Motor Car Company. And she is also the founder of Oakland University. So as of 1971, it was open to the public and is a historic house museum um, that became a national historic landmark in 2012 and operates as a cultural center. So we offer programming, community events, and facility rental um, is our biggest revenue source. We have a lot of weddings and private events there as well. So now that things are opening back up, and, and the pub, is the public going to be able to come back to Meadowbrook Hall soon? And, and what kind of services among those that you normally offer are you going to be offering now, albeit with probably some changes in place for safety reasons? Yes, of course, of course. So yes, like I mentioned, we opened last Friday, June the 19th, and this is what we call our phase one reopening plan. And what that looks like, it is modified. It's a little bit different so that we are able to accommodate all of the requirements for the, the, um, of the government mandates. So we'll be offering self-guided touring of the house, um, which allows guests to experience the house with still allowing social distancing. We ask that they wear face coverings while inside the home. Um, we'll have some volunteer or docents that'll be stationed on all three floors of the home and guests will be able to tour at their leisure. And we just recently implemented a new app. So now guests, because pr pr previously you were able to take a guided tour of Meadowbrook. So it's an 88,000 square foot home. So you can imagine there's a lot of information and in, in history and a lot of things to see and share. So how we were able to adjust that for our visitors is now give them this app they can download on their phone. They can tour at their own leisure within the parameters of the safety precautions, again, with the social distancing and the face coverings. And then we have our docents that are on three levels of the home and they can ask them questions. Now the tour route is all one way route so that that's safety there's a different entrance and a different exit so there's not a lot of cross traffic so visitors feel safe um so they that gives them an opportunity to experience a house a little bit different we've also opened up our grounds and we also introduced a new app for our gardens and grounds as well and guests can come onto the property download that app we have 16 gardens on the estate and they're quite beautiful and they're in full bloom our team our operations team has worked effortlessly to get those up and back and beautiful as they as they would be with our garden club helping as well. So guests, if they're not comfortable coming inside the home, they can certainly just enjoy our grounds and our property. They can download the app, they can tour the grounds, learn about the gardens on the property. We have all of our historic vehicles out on display as well. Um, we have, I think, 11 in the collection. We have nine out on display in our courtyard, so guests can look at the historic Dodge vehicles that we have on display. We'll have some music playing in the courtyard. We're encouraging visitors to come out and use the beautiful space to maybe have a picnic. Um, we have lawn games out as well. So we're really encouraging the public to just have some time away and to just enjoy the spaces at Meadowbrook, either indoors or outdoors. Um, so that's been, that started last week, and so far we've had a pretty positive response. What's great about this, you have so many families that aren't traveling right now due right. to the pandemic. They don't feel safe going to stay into a hotel or or even getting on an airplane. So this is a way for them to explore their own backyard. What's the one thing you would say is a must see if they come to Meadowbrook? Well, it's hard for me to pick tonight. Can I say two things? <laughs> so on the outside, I would say for sure they need to visit the Rose Garden. It's absolutely exceptionally beautiful. It's unique. It's one of a kind. It has these beautiful pillars and columns um, around the garden. It's just lovely. And then inside the home, I would say they'd have to see Matilda's bedroom suite. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, I'd say those two things to me are probably my two most favorite areas of the house. Um, and I think overall, it's just important to learn about, to your point, the history right here in our backyard and who these important people are um, who live right here, not who lived right here in our community and made such an impact on the region and, and the nation as a whole. So rather, if you like, you know, the, the decorative arts or the architecture or just the gardens, I think there's something for everybody, which makes it really nice for families. In terms of the indoor in the, of the indoor spaces, uh, with COVID-19 still very much an issue, 
uh, a safety issue and, and needing to keep all of their surfaces and areas clean as the public is coming in and out. Uh, what is Meadowbrook what is the Meadowbrook Estate and your operations doing in order to keep these places clean while also not um, damaging in any way the historic, uh, the historic uh, properties themselves? That's a great question. I'm glad that you uh, acknowledge that. It's a little bit more challenging because we have some historic collection items that we have to be careful of how we clean those surfaces. So first thing, a couple of things. When they enter into the space, like I mentioned, we're, we're, we're asking guests to wear face covering. We're abiding by this, the social distancing of six-foot policy, as well as we have hand, san hand sanitizer stations in a couple of places located throughout the hall so guests can use it while they're touring. Um, we also have updated our cleaning and sanitation procedures to happen three times a day, um, as well as using the disinfectant and sanitizers that were recommended by the CDC and of course, Oakland University. So we've increased that to multiple times a day. For things that cannot be touched because of their historic um, integrity, we do have certain things. So when you're walking up our wooden stair, you know, walking up our staircase, you know, that's a wooden handrail and you're not able to use those sanitizers or those cleaners or disinfectants that the CDC recommends. And so we do things like some natural solutions, but we're also offering. So like when guests, if they want to use the hand railing, we have a little table at the bottom of the stairs with a tissue that says, please take a tissue to walk up, you know, as you're walking up the, the stairs to use the hand railing. And then we ask they just dispose of it when they reach their destination. So what that does is it one protects the visitor. And it also, too, then protects those types of items and collections in the house that we have to be very careful how we care for them. In terms of hours of operations, are those at all going to be different now as we continue through the pandemic so that you can also have those times where maybe there's deep cleaning going on on top of what's being done day by day? Yes, that's a great question. Yes. So we are open. So we're limitedly open. So we're open Friday through Tuesday. So we're only open five days a week. Um, so yes, to answer your question, so we will continue a thorough cleaning process all seven days of week. So we'll be very thorough about that as well. Um, and we'll only open through July, we'll be open limited. And I'm not sure what we're going to do for August just yet, because as of right now, we're just open to the public five days a week. We're joined by Shannon Oberski, the Director of External Relations at the Meadowbrook Estate for Oakland University. Shannon, any virtual experiences now for those who are maybe still apprehensive about going back out to many public places that they don't need to go to for essential services. Are there still any virtual experiences uh, either that were already present during the bulk of the pandemic are now going to be present or are going to be uh, involved in the future for those to engage with the history at Meadowbrook Hall? Well, we do, like I mentioned earlier, we do do the history at the hall program, and that's not interactive. It's more of a video ser service series that we put together that we'll continue to do. Um, we're also exploring, um, our community events, events manager is exploring some different types of virtual events that we're going to, we're looking at doing probably later in the summer, or early fall. Um, right now, we do offer some community programs. They're not virtual, but because we have outdoor spaces and the capacity is at 100 um, people with social distancing. We do have a summer concert series that's coming up in uh, mid-July in the max capacity and the outdoor space is 100 people. So we're able to readjust and modify that event so that guests can come, be within the space safely um, and not interact with other folks if they don't want to. Um, so what we're doing is we're modifying a lot of our current stuff that we're doing that's, that was already planned to be outside, which does help. We have yoga in the garden as well. We had a one coming on this Sunday. We have them one Sunday a month throughout the summer. And again, that's outdoors, social distancing. We have a, a large, large expanse of lawn and guests are asked to you know, keep their yoga mats at least six feet apart. So again, maybe not virtual, but outdoor and allowing them to sort of control their space and their environment and how they want to explore the state at their own leisure. Shannon Oberski with us, the Director of External Relations at the Meadowbrook Estate, with us on the Oakland County Megacast on WAHS 89.5 Avondale Community Radio, 88.1 WBFH, The Biff, 89.3 Lakes FM, Birmingham Area Municipal Access and Civic Center TV. We're also joined today on the Facebook page of the Oakland County Animal Shelter and Pet Adoption Center, and thank them, of course, for being with us. So, Shannon, before we let you go, any other information? Where can people find more information on Meadowbrook Hall and, and maybe sign up for some programs. Great. So you can visit our website. It's meadowbrookhall.org. And that'll give you all the information for our tours, our admission prices, and all the events we have coming up. Wonderful. Uh, Shannon, anything else that you'd like to say? Anything else you'd like to touch on before we let you go? No, just thank you so much for having me. And I really hope we get some visitors out there to enjoy the space. I think they'll have a really wonderful time. 
Well, thank you very much for being with us. We appreciate having you on. Shannon Oberski, the Director of External Relations at Meadowbrook Estate for Oakland University with us on the Oakland County Megacast. And Ronnie, just another great recreation activity that people can engage in, learn some history, engage with some historical places in our community, enjoy the outdoors as well, but also be assured that they'll be able to do so in a safe manner. I think so many times we forget to explore our own backyards. We have a lot of history here in Michigan and in Metro Detroit, but sometimes we get focused on visiting other states or going to Disney or things of that nature when really there's a lot to see and do in our own backyards where we live. For I live on the West Bloomfield Trail. Every time you bike or you ride that trail, I find it fascinating the history of the signs and the placards and it talks about the development those are the little things that can be great for your family to get your kids out it helps with their education but it also allows them to really understand like where we started and where we are today the other thing great thing that we're seeing like with Meadowbrook is how they're taking technology with the app and they're implementing that into this new way of being able to get the most out of their environment. So technology has been a really big part of this. I don't know how easy this would be to survive without internet access. Oh, I totally agree. I think that you know, there's, not a, there's not a best time necessarily for a pandemic to happen, right. but at the same point, but by the same point, it's really the best time for a pandemic to be happening is where, where we're at right now because of all this access to technology and we're able to communicate better with our family and our friends when we're isolated and we're able to learn about all these local places as things even reopen and we're apprehensive about going from one place or the next place unless we absolutely have to go there or uh, if we're concerned about safety measures that we still have access to all of this different mm -hmm. information and all these interesting places and even virtually can visit these places without having to step foot in them. You know, I, I'm a little bit older than you, Tyler, but just a few, few years ago, even just starting to text people was a big deal. I remember saying, why do they text? Just pick up the phone and call. Now I almost never talk on the phone. Everything's via text. But Facebook Live, um, FaceTime, everything, this has changed completely how we communicate and it's really helped us stay connected during this crisis. It has helped us stay connected to our friends, to our family, to our places of work, even to, to a certain extent. And more importantly, to, the, to places in the community and to our history as well, allowing us to continue to recreate while we're, while we're trying to stay safe during the pandemic. So good to see Good to hear about all of what Meadowbrook Hall is doing through Oakland University to continue to bring some history to the forefront in our local community and uh, wish them the best as they're going forward and, and providing a look at history and a look at nature as well to those in our community. Ronnie and I are going to take a short break. We'll return after, after these quick messages, and we'll speak next with Representative Ryan Berman from Michigan's 39th District on the Oakland County Megacast. We'll be back after this. Hello, I'm Dr. Betty Chu, Chief Quality Officer at Henry Ford Health System, and I'm with Wright Lassiter, Henry Ford Health System's CEO, to talk about coronavirus. In uncertain times, it's natural to have questions. So I'm going to ask Dr. Chu to answer some of the common ones. First, why can't I visit my grandma to see if she's okay? Because the elderly are at a higher risk for complications with this disease, and you could inadvertently infect her. If I'm healthy, why can't I go out with my friends? The larger the crowd you're exposed to, the higher the chance you could get infected and infect others. If I have symptoms, why do I have to seek care? While the disease isn't dangerous for most people, for others, it can be. We need to understand how serious your case is because the right choices save lives. For more information, visit henryford.com or call 313-874-1055. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast on a family of TV and radio stations all throughout the local area. 
on Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99 on Birmingham Area Municipal Access and Civic Center TV. And on the radio, 89.3 Lakes FM and lakesfm.com, 88.1 WBFH, the Biff out of the Bloomfield Hill School District, and WAHS 89.5. Avondale Community Radio, that is service of Avondale Schools with service out of Avondale High School under the leadership of Station Manager Marty Schaefer and Technical Director and Engineer Keith Fraley. Getting us on the air each and every day, I'm Tyler Keith alongside Ronnie Dahl and a, lo a lot of issues all across the state that, that are being dealt with and um, a lot of partnership going on as, as well as we deal with these issues and across the aisle. People are looking to find solutions to the problems that we've seen amount during COVID-19 that are related to the virus and also related to things that are outside of the virus. And to talk to us about that partnership and finding solutions, we're joined now by one of our state representatives, Ryan Berman from Michigan's 39th district on the Oakland County Megacast. Ryan, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. So how are you? How's your team? Team is great. Everything's going well. Uh, back from Lansing, had a long week with session, finishing up on a lot of different bills that kind of, uh, you know, got put aside because of the COVID-19. So, you know, the House has been very busy, House and Senate, uh, going through and kind of getting our workload back to normal, getting through a lot of the stuff that we were supposed to the last couple months. So I had a couple long days in Lansing, got a lot of votes in uh, the other day and uh, starting to ramp up for the summer season. Well, it's good to hear that our legislatures are back in the office in Lansing and are working on getting things done uh, on the state level in the legislature, as we've seen during throughout this pandemic, a lot of those a lot of those moments were made in emergency situations. So some semblance of normalcy returning is something that I think the public can be really happy about. So uh, Sylvan Lake, the city of Sylvan Lake just introduced a new chief of police, Chief Brian Bassett. And you were once a Sylvan Lake police officer yourself. Your thoughts on the Sylvan Lake Police Department and uh, have you had a chance to meet their new police chief? Uh, not yet. I will be uh, meeting him either later today or Definitely next week. Uh, I, I have heard the news, and it's uh, very encouraging to get somebody of his caliber into the small department of Sylvan. Uh, now our little uh, tri-city area is all being manned at the top by uh, some really good quality individuals who all worked in Southfield which is a, a great department, a lot of good experience, learning experience. And with Chief Bassett joining the ranks of Chief Fitzgerald in Kego Harbor and Chief George in Orchard Lake, I think that, you know, just lends more to the cohesiveness of the three cities working together and uh, working together uh, to make our community safer and, and a great place to live, work, and play. Ryan, I love your perspective because you did work as a police officer. What can you say and what are your thoughts about the sentiment right now behind the defund the police movement? Yeah, you know what? It's it, it's interesting, and I, I do have a unique perspective on that because being on both sides of the badge, right? You know, being a citizen and having some encounters, uh, even when I was younger, even now of seeing sometimes, unfortunately, people come in contact, whether it's a police officer, teacher, in any industry, you have some bad apples, right? You had a teacher in one of your, your, your classes and one of your grades going up through high school, you just maybe didn't get along with, didn't like. You have, you go to a grocery store, you have an interaction, you know, that's just what it is as people. And unfortunately, with the police and the authority and position they're in, sometimes people have a bad experience and it's that bad experience with that, those bad apples that maybe ruin your taste and set, kind of give a broad brush of saying, oh, all police are like that. And I understand what's going on in our country. I understand what's uh, been going on in the, the necessity and people's right to protest. And I absolutely support that and, and agree with that. But one of the things that have come out of what's going on 
you know, nationally and locally in, in our state is you have people, it, it's about your message, right? And one of the messages coming out of these movements is defunding the police. And I think that's moving to the absurd. And when you start talking about defunding the police, what does that look like? Uh, and everybody has their own, I guess, idea. And there really maybe isn't a cohesive or, or one section uh, sentiment with that. But the point is, is words have meaning. And when you talk about defunding something, that means not funding it. And you have individuals calling to not fund the police and to abolish police departments. And I think that's taking it to the absurd. And specifically in our area, and we were talking about Sylvan Lake, a small department, Kego Harbor, another small department, Orchard Lake, people like to have their police like they, part of their community, but there are people on the other side that don't. We had to put millages in and, and Kego Harbor was, was threatened a couple years ago with not having the money and resources to continue their own department. And West Bloomfield, was going to maybe step in and take over services. Other areas, you have the Oakland County Sheriff's coming in. And when you have that, sometimes, and depending on the situation, you have officers coming in, and it happened in Inkster with the Michigan State Police having to pick up patrols, that you don't have officers that are community-oriented, the community policing, living or, or being in that community. You have outsiders coming in who maybe don't have those same personal contacts with the residents. And sometimes that's even more of a, uh, us versus them mentality or, you know, one step away. And it diminishes some of that trust, some of that, that bridge building. And I think it's important to have that, to have these, these smaller departments most of the time and to have the community policing. And when you're talking about defunding or getting rid of a police department, you have to think of what does that do? It makes people less safe. It makes any type of relationship with the police more strained. And talking about you know how this whole thing started of whether it's police training or more training when you're talking about defunding police the the assumption is that they're well funded now and that's not necessarily the case and one of the first things to go in in police budgets is the training budget and they get less training with less dollars and that's not what we need so, so i put forth a resolution to you know basically say no we don't need to defund police departments whatever other issues there are. And I had colleagues on the other side of the aisle give speeches against this resolution. And I totally agree with them and I understand their perspective, but they even stood up and say, hey, we don't, we're not talking about defunding police. We're not talking about polishing police departments. We're talking about this and that. That's fine. And that's the case. Then let's talk about those things. Let's not use say defund the police if you really don't mean defund the police. Representative Ryan Berman from Michigan's 39th district with us. And I, I think that you did make that, that, that point there re really well, that it's not necessarily cutting funding from the police altogether or, or abolishing the police altogether, that that's what's being strived for from both sides. I think both sides of the aisle see that there are some issues at hand that need to be addressed, and there are some things that could be better done in our police departments and, and, and in a law enforcement perspective in our communities and that the focus is more on how can we reform or re-emphasize the good in, the, in police departments through training, like we see a lot of times in smaller departments, through de-escalation training, through greater implicit bias training. And I think that is becoming more of something that people are focusing on, knowing that police departments in all likelihood are going to continue to, to exist and are necessary to some extent. No, absolutely. And that's the whole point where you do have a fringe or you do have this uh subsection or even section of the communities saying defund and i'm saying hey this is dangerous to use those words let's craft a different message let's talk about what really needs to be done and i think you know just having those conversations you know getting together whether you know it's bipartisan basis community basis the police you know we have to get rid of the whole divided divisiveness really in in our country in every type of area the us versus them mentality the police you know we saw it here in in what was it genesee county that the sheriff up there national news when they had protests he said hey let's i'll march with you let's do it together and i think that's the right message you know who is the police officer and again that's why community policing getting to know the person behind the badge 
police officers are people just like you and me and they're individuals they're mothers they're fathers brothers sisters they're your, your family and it's not putting that just that label on somebody it's getting to know them and the bringing these perspectives together to do what's best for everybody and communication forward. and communication has to be critical in, in solving any issue so it's good that that there, there are conversations that are being had at the state level and that people are coming to the table to say let's talk about these issues and let's find solutions and instead of continuing to argue about it because arguing about it's going to allow these to go on for that much longer so senator berman moving on we just have a few more minutes with you the state's got a got a serious unemployment problem right now millions of people over two million people are unemployed hundreds of thousands of people have had their accounts frozen due to potential fraudulence um, from people that are using people's identity for unemployment claims that mm -hmm. are not correct the unemployment agency has said announced earlier this week that they have a goal of resolving backlogged cases from march 15th my apologies from march 15th to may 1st that's over 12,000 cases by July 4th. Do you believe that this is a feasible goal to accomplish for the UIA alone? And is there anything that's being worked on at the state level um, between your fellow representatives and, and those in the Senate as well on both sides of the aisle to help further resolve this issue because it's a serious issue for hundreds of thousands, in fact, millions of people in our state? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the biggest issue that me and my staff have been working on for the last couple months. Um, I don't know what's feasible. I know that we've been getting different numbers, but that the House and Senate put together a joint task force to oversee the state's response to COVID-19. So it's an oversight committee on the COVID-19 pandemic. And it really stems, reaches any type of issues, whether it's the nursing home issue that you talked to Senator Lucido about earlier today, or now this unemployment issue. Uh, they already had hearings and they're diving deep into what's going on with our unemployment insurance agency. Uh, they've had a couple hearings and had testimony on the backlog on what's going on and what the leadership there at the that agency is doing. I don't know what's going to come of it as far as is it a realistic time frame. I know that my uh, my constituent relations director, Zach Serzo, he's been basically dealing with this every single day. I mean, it, we kind of joke, it's not funny that he's really working for the unemployment insurance agency because he's handling cases. And it's not just my office, it's every single representative's office, you know, over the state that we're getting totally overwhelmed. Um, hundreds and hundreds, in some uh, cases, thousands of uh, cases in each representative's office trying to resolve that they haven't heard from the unemployment insurance agency in months we were getting some good results initially up until uh a couple of weeks ago and they switched over a system that is i guess more user friendly but it's just not getting the results that it, it's been intended uh unfortunately i think as of last week when you're talking about the backlog they they were a month behind so cases that we submitted for priority or trying to do, whether it was somebody typed in their driver's license number wrong or uh, some little issue. A lot of times it's little, you know, clerical issues that just need a swap of a number, or put something in wrong or didn't fill in. And that takes a couple minutes, but there's just not the manpower to do it. So there was a backlog over a month. I think they, they finally resolved a case from April 29th, but you know, now we're at the end of June. So, you know, for them to say or their goal by July 4th, by next week to be resolved through through May, that's great. But, you know, what's happened in the last four or six weeks? I mean, it just keeps getting pushed back and, and it's a big problem. And, and that will continue to see what comes of that. And we've, and we've talked to senators. We've talked to representatives from both the Democratic side and the Republican side who are all saying the same thing that you're saying. They have a significant number of their own staffers who are on this issue each and every day and it's tough to get any sort of resolution so representative ryan berman unfortunately we only have about a minute left in the show today so we're going to have to let you go but we thank you for joining us once again here on northern county megacast yeah thank you anytime and anybody who has any issues just co contact my office i'm very accessible and we're here to help and we're going to try to do the best we can dealing with these state departments 
We appreciate it. Representative Ryan Berman from Michigan's 39th District with us on the Oakland County Megacast today. Always, always a pleasure to have him on with us and have a nice conversation about a range of issues and uh, and always to have a conversation about about it from multiple perspectives and he provides that perspective too so we appreciate that as well ronnie at the end of the day we have to remember they work for us we elected exactly. these people into the office so when we have these issues be sure to reach out and try to get some resolution that's what they're there for absolutely and that's what we're here for too to help you bring help bring that information to you we thank you for tuning in all week this has been the oakland county megacast will return on monday <laughs>